So welcome everyone. We are at about 2.05 um, according to my clock, so we're going to get started. Welcome to Introducing Ending Violence Without Violence. My name is Chelsea Miller. I'm the Communications Director at the New York State Coalition Against Se Sexual Assault. I'm joined by Miriam Kaba of Project NIA, Survived and Punished and Interrupting Criminalization. I'm also joined by Janelle Bove of the Seven Dancers Coalition, which is the Indigenous Anti-Violence Coalition in New York and Haudenosaunee Country. To get some logistics out of the way, uh, let's see. If you have any technology problems, please enter those in the chat box. If you have any content questions, please use the Q&A box, which I'll be monitoring throughout the afternoon. If you cannot access either the chat box or the Q&A, if you're joining by phone, for example, please email me at cmiller at niscasa.org. That's C-M-I-L-L-E-R at N-Y-S-C-A-S-A dot O-R-G. And just to confirm, this webinar is being recorded and we'll be sharing it later along with some resources that we mentioned. So before we get started, I'd like to ask all of our participants, our attendees, um, where you're joining us from. Please enter that in the chat box. And I'll read out some answers as they come in. I'm seeing Illinois, Oakland, Oneonta, Massachusetts, Baltimore, Syracuse, Brooklyn, Los Angeles, Albany, Chicago, we're, we've got someone from Cape Town in South Africa. Awesome, we're all over the place. It's fantastic. Our next question, um, if you can share in the chat box too, what drew you to this webinar? We've got looking for options. Looking to get more information on restorative and transformative justice. We've got someone interested in decarceral solutions to intimate partner violence. We've got someone interested in the conference in June and the whole series. Working to develop RJ on college campuses. Interested in alternative means of dispute resolution. How to balance anti-gender violence and anti-mass incarceration movements. Awesome, thank you everyone. So I'm gonna be talking for about 10 minutes and then I'll turn it over to Miriam and Janelle. Awesome, thank you folks. So this webinar is the first in a series called Ending Violence Without Violence, which will serve as lead up programming for the June 2020 conference of the same name, which is being organized by the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault, Seven Dancers Coalition, and Interrupting Criminalization. Today's webinar will summarize the state of efforts to end sexual violence in mainstream and in community contexts. We'll also talk about ways to support rape victims and survivors outside of the criminal legal system. The series as a whole is intended to generate hype for the June 2020 conference. It's going to be a space for us to introduce core principles of restorative justice, transformative justice, community accountability, and other community-centered approaches to violence prevention and response. It'll also help us develop a shared understanding of the importance of building communities that can prevent sexual violence, respond to sexual harm, and heal trauma. The point of these webinars is to develop a learning community before the June conference. This conference will be held, excuse me, the conference will be held in June 3rd through 6th, 2020 in Syracuse, New York. I'll circulate the information about how to, how to sign up later. Um, what we wanted to share too is we have two webinars currently scheduled and two more to be announced. On February 5th, we'll have a webinar with Sujatha Baliga on restorative justice approaches to sexual violence. And on February 19th, we'll have a webinar with Stas Schmidt and Lee Roth of Spring Up on transformative approaches to sexual violence. 
I will circulate these links later as well. So the whole, the, the point of this webinar today is to introduce the series, to get folks excited for the conference, and to just start start some of the conversations that we need to have before the conference actually happens. So today we'll be talking about sexual violence prevention and response in the mainstream context, which is the work that occurs within rape crisis centers, law enforcement agencies, and government agencies, as well as the community context, which is really broad, but we'll be talking about the work that occurs outside of the systems. The earliest rape crisis centers were established in the early 70s by rape survivors and their supporters. They tended to be grassroots collectives with limited funding. And rape crisis workers and volunteers advocated and continue to advocate for legislative reform, educating the public, and getting better treatment and more resources for survivors. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, new laws were passed in an effort to better serve survivors. And as a result, rape crisis programs, DV programs, and other victim services organizations ended up with getting access to funding. Uh, police departments were also educated to improve their protocols and some hospitals began to provide special exam rooms and trained nurse examiners. As rape crisis programs gained access to funding, we increasingly relied on the criminal legal system and legislative strategies to prevent and respond to sexual violence. This has meant legislating that forms of non-consensual sexual contact are against the law. And according to those laws, the consequences for sexual abuse and assault are punishment through incarceration or fines, depending on who you are. This has also meant encouraging victims to report to law enforcement. And this has meant encouraging law enforcement to increase arrests and pressuring prosecutors to push for harsher sentences. Um, over the last 40 years, the criminalization of sexual violence has resulted in the simultaneous growth of rape crisis centers and resources for victims, alongside an expansion of the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration. Through this time, rape crisis programs and sexual assault coalitions developed strong relationships with law enforcement in an attempt to provide support to sexual assault survivors. And Mimi Kim calls this dancing the carceral creep. Um, but the criminal legal system doesn't always offer healing or justice for all survivors. And not every survivor wants to or can safely engage with law enforcement. Out of every thousand sexual assaults, only 230 are ever reported to law enforcement. And as far as the recommended reading that I've got on the bottom of the screen here, we'll be sharing this later too. Survivors with marginalized identities, whether they're people of color, immigrants, disabled, mentally ill, or engaged in the sex trade, cannot safely interact with law enforcement. And many survivors just choose not to for various reasons. We also know that criminalizing harm doesn't necessarily prevent it, nor does it mean people who do harm actually face consequences. Out of 230 sexual assaults reported to police, 46 would lead to, might lead to arrest, nine get referred to prosecutors, five lead to a conviction, and fewer than five might lead to incarceration. And when the consequence is incarceration, we subject people who do harm to further cycles of violence, whether it's state violence or the physical, mental, and sexual abuse someone might experience while incarcerated. The burden of criminalization also falls on people with marginalized identities, especially black men, women, gen and gender nonconforming folks. And the over-reliance on criminalization has put countless community members at risk for further victimization. So, before you joined the webinar and when you registered, we asked you to read the statement on gender violence and the prison industrial complex from Insight Women of Color Against Violence and Critical Resistance. The statement provides kind of a guiding framework for this conference, the webinar series, and Niskasa's mission going forward. I'm going to read a quote that I'm sharing up on the PowerPoint for anyone who can't see it. We seek to build movements that not only end violence, but that create a society based on radical freedom, mutual accountability, and passionate reciprocity. In this society, safety and security will not be premised on violence or the threat of violence. It will be based on a collective commitment to guaranteeing the survival and care of all peoples. So going forward, 
what we hope to do is to create spaces for survivors to heal and seek accountability without being forced to go through the criminal legal system. We hope to create spaces where community members have the tools to prevent abuse without causing further violence and trauma. We hope to create spaces where people who cause sexual harm can achieve true accountability. And we hope to create more options for survivors of sexual violence, especially those who choose not to or cannot safely engage with the criminal legal system. And so we're looking to community contexts because we realize that people are doing this work already and have been doing this work. And with that, I'm going to shift to the community context and ask Janelle and Mariam, whoever wants to go first, um, what have efforts to look like to, to end sexual violence looked like in contexts outside of the criminal legal system? And what other sites of organizing and support for rape victims are out there. Janelle, would you like to start? Oh, sure, for sure. I was just being polite and trying to wait. But yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for the cue. So um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure and greet everybody. Welcome to this, you know, really great stimulating conversation. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity and all of the hard work that everyone is doing for us to address um, these really heavy, um, heavy, harmful topics that can, you know, weigh, weigh heavily on us. But, um, but for the most part, yes. Um, so, uh, Chelsea, just going back to the question, um, you said, what were some ways in which we're addressing violence without necessarily relying on the criminal justice system? Was that, that's the question? Yes, that was the question. Okay, thank you. Um, so, right, so, so part of being in an Indigenous community here in upstate New York, uh, we are literally on the U.S.-Canadian border. Part of our community uh, politically lies between two countries, two counties, and two provinces. Um, so talk about a, a, a pretty dynamic um, mess there. But when it comes to um, getting into the, the heart of families and personal intimate traumas, um, more often than not, right, the trauma is happening internally. So it's happening within the home. And you know, obviously a majority of people um, don't want to see their family members um, harmed or locked up, but they still don't know what to do with this harm, right? So it doesn't go anywhere. It just keeps getting um, re-perpetrated in other areas. And we also know that the large amount of the source of violence is generated through our men. And so taking steps to approach um, some of that, um, some of that harm that's being caused was directly uh, making it a point to, to make an investment in men. So part of the strategy was to actually uh, focus more on vulnerable populations such as men coming out of treatment centers and men coming out of prison. And so them transitioning from these um, institutions and back into the community, we either already try to have some form of contact before their release um, have some sort of significant um, acknowledgement when they come back into the community and then continue to reinforce and be consistent with that support. Um, and so with that uh, in mind, we started generating, we extracted these really beautiful fundamental pieces of our culture that acknowledge the mind, the body, the spirit, uh, the lessons, the wisdom, that whole spectrum of a, a human being's experience. And we took that approach to how we were going to start um, being able to, one, create a safe space, you know, to acknowledge that hurt that's been caused, and then also trying to um, shed a little light in the direction of what might be, you know, helpful to not only them, but to the community at large. And when we started um, implementing and practicing uh, ways of culture and, and having the consultation of other elders in the community, we have absolutely seen um, 
100% of the time, uh, really great results, not only for the individual and the families, but also um, for the community as a whole. And so we don't advertise the ceremonies. We don't do any of that. They're all um, word of mouth, but we definitely leave those, those spaces open to the community and to the public because part of us trying to push uh, uh, learning to not just punish people, it not only goes to the individuals that we're working with, but to educate the, the community at large. So they need to be able to witness what forgiveness can look like. They need to start, you know, being present to what emotion and healing and relief can look like. And so we always try to be uh, inclusive, respectful, and mindful, right, of, of the circumstances. And so um, sometimes uh, the people directly harmed and affected aren't always there, but at least having people in the room that are able to hold a space of um, encouragement and, um, and, and goodwill and, and good intentions can help someone um, uh, put down their shame and start gaining some confidence and belief that they do have the ability to um, live past their mistakes and actually make a real amends, if not with themselves, but with their, um, with their, their presence in the community in general. And so I don't want to take, uh, I can talk for a really long time, so I don't want to like um, uh, get into, I just wanted to leave some time for Miriam to respond to that. Thanks, Janelle. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. Um, this is Miriam, and uh, happy to be here and part of the discussion to kick off the series. I hope people come back and hear uh, from Sujatha and from Stas and Lee, um, all of whom have been doing work around these issues for a long time, and I've been really uh, blessed to be in community with for many years, so um, they're going to be great. Um, in response to your question, Chelsea, I want to go back to a point you made early on, which was that sexual assault is actually incredibly underreported in terms of compared to other kinds of harms, um, and only sometimes actually prosecuted. And I think one of the things I've over the years been perplexed by is quote unquote people saying they are resistant to community uh, focused solutions when that's the main interventions that have always existed, right? Like, it's actually the, the thing that's not the norm, that's the actually abnormal, if you want to call it that thing, is for people to actually report or to go to social services. Um, so I take it from the perspective of, like, if you're doing work in a community context, you're in the mainstream. That's where the work has to be happening. And what I'm concerned about is that often in our communities, because it's important not to, quote, romanticize the concept of community, a lot of harm, most of the harm occurs in communities. So um, we go anywhere from interventions that are nothing, right? No one doing anything, no one offering anything, everybody averting their gaze, to very intense, profound, deep work that involves a lot of people in a community. So what we call community accountability processes, right? It's a spectrum of interventions, just like we have a spectrum of harm. I mean, you know, a community-based solution sometimes is also taking a baseball bat and going and beating the shit out of someone, right? We might call that, you know, vigilantism, but that's a community-based intervention as well, right? I like to make sure people realize that we have a spectrum of community intervention. Some of it is restorative, some of it is transformative, and some of it is incredibly punitive. So just using a term like community control or community centered means really nothing. I just, you know, it's, it, it's meaningless. You have to, you put some meat on the bones when you're expressing what is it that you're actually trying to do? Um, how are you trying to actually intervene? How are you including and involving more than just the person who was harmed and the person who caused harm? Because I have to be honest, we're not going to uproot sexual violence by just focusing on people who were harmed, survivors, and people who caused the harm. 
we we use the term rape culture, but I don't think people really understand what that means. It means that we're all implicated in sexual violence. It means that a whole bunch of our institutions are actually perpetrating, reproducing, and maintaining sexual violence every day. One of those spaces that is the most likely to actually replicate and reinforce sexual violence are punishing systems, um, detention centers, um, jails, prisons. Those places are inherently sexual violence, right? So we make the point, many of us who've been doing work on these issues, whether it was in, through Insight or through Survived and Punished or through other projects, that state and intimate violence are connected and that they're dependent on each other. And that if we don't understand that, we're not actually going to be able to deal with that. And that our current responses to violence have not significantly reduced the rates of violence. So we need new and different strategies for different types of violence. Some of those strategies may be vigilantism for particular communities. I don't know, right? Like those communities might look at the situation and be like, you know what? No, baseball bats actually do work for us, right? Other communities are like, well, we don't want to actually solve violence with more violence. And so we're looking for other ways to intervene. And some of that involves very intricate, long-term processes that people create outside of uh, the criminal punishment system to try to figure out how to not, you can't impose accountability from the outside. It's not a thing that works. You can impose compliance but you can't impose accountability and transformation. So a lot of us who do work outside the system really focus on how are we gonna create the space to basically encourage people to take accountability for what they do. So it's a voluntary thing, which again, last thing I'm gonna say is that often makes people very uncomfortable and angry because often what people say they want when they say they want consequences, it's actually they want punishment. And one way that I wanna point that out is we're currently in a process where a very prominent athlete who many people lionized suddenly died at a young age. And that person raped somebody. And there's this weird thing that's occurred, which is either people pretending that that didn't happen or people wanting to only focus on that. And what I think all the time is, it shows the confusion we have about what we mean when we talk about consequences for harm that has occurred. I've heard people say things like, well, Kobe Bryant didn't face any consequences for the actions that he took. That's ludicrous. Of course he had consequences. What happened, what didn't happen is that he didn't get punished by the state. And so we have to like, what are you really talking about when you're talking about what you mean by consequences or punishment? What, what does that mean? Consequences are, for example, that he was actually charged with sexual violence and assault and faced many, many years in prison. That's a consequence, right? Um, another consequence is that he lost a bunch of endorsements. Another consequence is that now that he died, everybody's still talking about the fact that he raped somebody. Like that's in, that's in the obituaries. That's part of this person's legacy. That's a consequence. He went to civil court and lost and paid damages. That was a consequence. Like, we have to, like, start getting super clear with ourselves about what it is that we want to have happen and what are we trying to actually accomplish. Are we trying to make sure that, you know, people are take, take accountability for what they said? He, quote, unquote, apologized. People call it a half confession. But that apology was there and it was demanded by the survivor. Like, these are things that actually happened. And to me, I find that we're really in a position in our culture where really a lot of people want punishment and they ask for other things instead of saying just plain out that what they want is punishment. For me, punishment doesn't actually work to end violence. And so I care about harm and I care about ending harm. And so I'm trying to figure out how are we going to do that to the best of our abilities in our community without relying on death-making institutions. So I'll just end with that and just say that there are plenty of examples. The examples outnumber the examples of using the state. So I don't understand why people constantly are talking about things like they can't wrap their brains around. But how can you not wrap your brains around the thing that is the mainstream intervention? <laughs> like, I don't understand what people are talking about. Yeah, Miriam, I really appreciate, um, Miriam and Janelle, I really appreciate both of your 
your contribution here today and Miriam specifically um, kind of highlighting like what is actually mainstream, um, you know, the way that many people are responding and preventing sexual violence is outside of the system right. and it is possible. Um, I guess I have a follow-up question um, for both of you. In your experience, what what does it look like to really support someone who has done sexual harm? And what are some strategies, and this could go on to kind of the next part of our slides here, um, what are some strategies you know of that people have used to, to help somebody voluntarily take accountability? Well, and, um, and, and what I've seen, like, I feel like there's so much response for after the fact, you know, we're, we're all damage control. And I feel like the investment to the prevention, like what's the source of what's causing sexual violence, what's causing violence, and especially in our men, um, looking at them and being <coughs> demasculated, not knowing how to communicate, uh, not having certain support systems. So, you know, trying in my own as a mother and having a son, um, basically it has, it's got to start at home, right? What does it look like for me to have a conversation with my son about his sexuality? He's too spirited, uh, trying to help him in resources and trying to figure out what does it look like for him to have safe sex with another man? Um, all of those things to break down the stigma and the shame. So in indigenous communities, we are immersed in violence in every aspect. And what it tells me about the human spirit and the human experience is that in spite of all of the uh, uh, adversities, especially I have a whole measurement, I'm living in a community where every member of this community has gone through miles high of trauma and loss and tragedy and generational, right? It's in their DNA that um, to, to experience abuse and loss, but also the ability to uh, have growth and insight and transform. Historically, all of our culture depicts um, actually narratives around people who led really kind of like dark lives and had this pivoting moment where they had to take account of something. There's some sort of intervention, some sort of grace, some sort of blessing that comes in and alters the whole morale of that person. And so I've come to appreciate the human experience and, and trying to help keep people connect with that is that violence is in all of us. We all have the ability, right, to harm another person. And most likely, every one of us at some point in our life is going to cause harm, either willingly or unwillingly, you know, but I think for the most part, for one, the, the conversations and um, the, the ability to, to uh, just generate and stimulate discussion, especially with young people, you know, I feel like we've uh, put so much responsibility on them and not kind of held ourselves responsible. We're expecting uh, something different when, you know, in, in their schooling, where are they learning about how to generate pleasure? for themselves? Where are we teaching them about how their body genuinely works, not just sexually, but in all those ways of stimulation? And so I feel like part of the institutionalism of the education, quote unquote, system, it prohibits a lot of the stuff that, that supports them as being human beings, right? So they don't have no understanding about um, grief they have no understanding about, you know, what does it look like to process a, um, a loss or to, to, to know what joy is, to know what fulfillment needs. Like, we, they don't ever uh, come to these places until they've already caused all this damage within themselves and the people that love them. And then, right, that ripple effect that goes out into the community. And so I feel like it's part of putting the emphasis back in there because when you've, the, even the language that we use is limited, you know? So taking into context that all of our, our or, origins of how we originally expressed, communicated, all of those things are super helpful tools, basic, simple, hereditary tools that we, that we come with, but where do we strengthen that muscle, right? Where, where do we start 
um, jumping in there uh, sooner than later. And so the investment, I call it an investment, but you know, for the most part, like when do we start jumping in and doing that? And so I, I, in all honesty, part of our, um, part of our spirituality and cultural basis is around energy. It's all about energy and the balance between the polarities of men and women. So we're often taking into context the relationship between the natural world, which is also a huge disconnect for a lot of people because the natural world will teach you about living in, in harmony and learning about the fruition of um, a universe that's perfect in its own um, course of nature. So. Um, when we talk about the sun and the moon and the relationship between those two, uh, it's interesting how it, it's almost like it ignites something with inside of them because we're not usually talking about the sun and the moon when it comes in terms of relationships, but that's a real relationship, right? So when do we see the sun being the male and the moon being the grandmother, you know, in, in our um, stories and teachings, when do we see them fighting? over who has more control who has more power you know so when we when we make references to things like that it lets us know that there's things beyond us that show us every day how to live in this um more in this um i would want to say like almost harmonious kind of society you know so always pulling people back remember you know remember who you are because usually if we're causing violence or we're, we've forgotten you know, or we don't know what our gift is. We don't know what our contribution is. We don't know our value. We don't know our, like, and, and for the most part, it's when people have worth, their decisions have worth. And so it's just trying to remind people that this, all of this is inside of you. I just, hopefully, maybe uh, something I've said today will help you uh, navigate back to that original place of who you are and who you want to be. And so um, a lot of times we're just tr working in and around that kind of human basis. And then it helps us address any, pretty much any issue that comes um, into um, our workspace for people. So it's been uh, very rewarding and exciting to um, use our, our, our tribe and our, our, um, our people and pull them in. Um, apply these really beautiful ways of being with one another and watching the medicine of that um, actually be be taken and um, and it, it bringing you know more wellness to people than than previously so um, yeah I just wanted to say that much go ahead Miriam I'll let you sure thanks um, yeah so how do we support people who have harmed people how do we support people who have violated people right sexual violence is a violation of relationship it's a violation of body and bodily accountability bodily integrity um it's a violation of trust you know all those things are real and i think there are two ways to think about this for me at least one is that you have to do intense personal work and interpersonal work with people um, around, t you know, encouraging them to take accountability. And it, you can't really, it's hard to do that when the culture doesn't support people actually admitting that they did a thing, right? It, so we need like a both and strategy. Some of us have to be working on the cultural transformation work and some of us need to be doing individual interventions with people, both and at the same time. Because in order for someone to take accountability, they have to have some faith that they can own what they did and still be held in community, right? Like if the, if the idea is that you admit what you did and try to start to actually come up with insight over why you did it express real genuine remorse that you've harmed people and then try to make amends and repair um even though you're never going to be able to e eradicate the wounds um because the wounds are permanent um and and you know the scars are permanent even when people move on um i think that it's hard to do that in our current culture um the current system makes people almost immediately into defendants and that means that's the opposite of accountability. Um, you know, it's the opposite of the internal resource you take 
that you have for understanding what's right and wrong and then working based on that, like your whole entire being is to deny that you actually did the thing that you did. The culture actually insists that people do that because the fear is always that if they don't, then they have the Damocles sword of the criminal legal system hanging over their heads. So we're gonna need to do a lot of work to insist that like people actually be courageous in saying, yes, I did this, I acknowledge it, I need to figure out how to quote unquote, uh, figure out why, and then I need to actually make a transformative behavior change as a result. That's really in our current system, an act of deep, deep faith and courage. I'm just finishing um, a, a community accountability process that has been two years in the making with somebody who um, harmed somebody else sexually um, and we are trying to wrap up the process now. And one of the things that I constantly reminded everybody in the process about was the fact that we were acting actually in contradiction to everything that, that any kind of advice you would give to somebody in this current culture. Um, because really in this culture, like if you're going to if you've done something wrong, your incentive is to actually deny that you did the thing. Um, if you like, if you're really kind of making any sense. So the fact that these folks were willing to engage in something totally different um, was an act of courage on everybody's part. The survivor's part for wanting to really sit with this and, and, and have this hashed out and understanding that like these processes are not linear processes, that genuine behavior change is really difficult that often our worst actions are rooted in deep trauma. Um, so I always think about that for myself, that the work we're trying to do in supporting people to take accountability is very different from the quote, holding people accountable vision of things that people often put out there. I also want to say that I, I, I hear a lot of people say, well, community processes don't work. And I'm like, what did you do? And they're like, we had a circle. And I'm like, that's not a friggin' process. Like, that's a circle. You know, so like, I think there's a lack of understanding of like what it takes to do this kind of work, which is a lot of time, investment, uh, failures, um, mistakes, um, expecting, like resisting accountability is actually an expected part of accountability work. You should be planning for it rather than like running away from it. Like all those things are real. Um, so for me, like success and community accountability processes actually looks like a lot of mistakes, failures, and then some wins. Um, but I also like to make sure that the folks know that like we're reframing the idea that accountability is actually part of support. Um, you know, that like actually what we're doing by like having a bunch of folks support you through this process, knowing you're going to make a whole bunch of bad judgments along the way um, is a form of support, right? Um, and that's important. And last thing I'll say is that how does it look to support people who've been harmed? It looks like a hundred different kinds of things. It looks like providing and supporting people in what, however they feel they need to be supported in order to be on a healing journey. For me, over the years, as I've been doing work on CA processes, they're often not healing processes. And I think that's something that maybe is surprising to people who would think that they are. They're not. They're very hard processes that bring up a lot of emotions. If all the parties who are part of this are actually involved, if you've got a survivor and you've got their friends and you've got a person who caused harm and you've got their friends involved in something like this, that's usually you're feeling terrible. Like things are coming up for you. You're angry. The person who harmed you is maybe not like following the linear path and you're getting discouraged. Like all these things are occurring. So what the best possible accountability processes I've been part of do for people is it puts people on a road towards their healing journey, right? It, it puts them on a, on a path so that they can continue the work of their healing. The process itself often is not healing itself. Um, and so I just, you know, those are some things I wanted to bring up because I think there's a lot of confusion over what is and what is not 
transformative justice, what is and what is not restorative justice. A lot of people talk about restorative justice and the first thing they start talking about is forgiveness when in fact, if you read any of the restorative justice practitioners who I've been taught by, they speak almost never about forgiveness because it's not really about forgiveness. Um, it's about maybe the person who caused harm trying to forgive themselves in order to be able to be in a position where they can do better. But it isn't like the person who was harmed saying, oh, now I forgive you after this process. If that comes out of it, that's great. And that might work for that person. But you don't have to forgive the person who harmed you. You can hate them and still go through a restorative justice process and actually find that that was helpful to you. Right? Um, so I just think there's just a lot of confusion over what these things are and are not. And in part, it's because people don't actually read anything. <laughs> Like, that's what, like, people just don't actually do any study, and they just kind of, like, pick up one thing they heard from somebody else, and that becomes, like, the basis of the knowledge of the whole thing. So that's why I never trust people who talk to me about, like, oh, RJ doesn't work. I'm like, what did you do in RJ? Tell me what happened. Like, what was your RJ process? What did you do? And there's like very little answer because people don't actually do these practices. They talk about them or they think about them or they analyze them. But very few people are practicing them. And so I just think we have to be honest about that. And if we're going to do this work, we got to practice. We got to do it. We got to actually engage. We got to be in the muck of it. Um, that's the only way to be able to learn and to be able to grow and to be able to figure out what needs to happen for people. You actually have to do it. I'm seeing a lot of survivors of sexual violence saying they want to have restorative practices, processes. They want community accountability processes, and there's almost no one available to take them through that process. There are no guides because nobody's actually training themselves up and skilling themselves up to be able to do this work. So I just want to put those things out there on the table. And I think that's part of what will be discussed at the conference are like, you know, do some study and figure out like how to do the work, actually, how to practice it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we share um, before we move on to Q&A too is Miriam very kindly shared um, a ton of information with me about different forms of community accountability models. I'm not going to read through them right now, but when you receive the PowerPoint, you'll be able to read through and see that there are different community accountability models and different processes that work and have been working throughout the country and even throughout the world. Um, I'm just going to <coughs> quickly, carefully go through some slides, but you'll receive this later. Um, and yeah, one of the most important things that we at Niscasa want to emphasize is like none of this is new and people are doing all yeah. of this work and have been doing this work for a very long time. Um, and in, in the next couple of webinar series, the webinars in this series, we will be learning from people who have been doing restorative processes or transformative processes. Um, I think that's so, such an important point that you make, Chelsea, that this is not new work. This is very old work. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's often it's actually really new work to privilege people. Right. Like folks who most of us who come from communities where we cannot rely on the state because the state is actually our aggressor and our oppressor, as well as the people who are harming us. There, you have to be really creative and figure out how you're going to survive and how you're going to work and what you're going to do. And so we've been doing work on the ground for generations. And so I'm again going to go back to like everybody should switch their mind frames and really understand that the, main, the mainstream are community accountability models. What's out of context and what is actually the minority view is using the state to solve our problems. So if you, like, because many, I notice particularly white folks come at this from a perspective of, like, the norm is the criminal punishment system and everything else is, quote, that's the, the part that's not the norm. And I just want people to flip the script and understand that it's the complete opposite for good or bad, but it's the complete opposite. 
especially when we're talking about issues of sexual violence and domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really helpful to think about, um, particularly because I had organized this webinar in such a way that it, I used a binary of the mainstream and the community when mm -hmm. it's really, it's the norm and then there's the stuff that's funded. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So yeah, thank you both so much. Um, we've got about 12 minutes left. Um, if you could, if participants and attendees who are watching and listening, if you're able to access the chat box, we'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Um, and in the meantime, too, if you have questions for Janelle and Miriam, please enter those in the Q&A box. Um, so something we'd like you to think about is like what interests you the most about the upcoming conference and the webinars? And what other, what other kinds of content would you like to see in light of what we've talked about today? And again, if you have questions, please enter those in the Q&A box. And Janelle and Miriam, if you have anything else to share too, please feel free. Okay. We've got a question. Um, do folks have any insights or strategies regarding how to engage in community accountability processes with people who are incarcerated, who have the dual identity of being harmed and having had done harm while also being in a violent institution? It's a big one. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's actually a few projects and programs that are working currently with lock, people who are locked up doing actual community accountability and restorative justice work with those groups. Um, there's a great organization out um, in, um, uh, the, in California called the Ahimsa Collective, mm -hmm. and I will put that in the chat box. Um, you can find them at, you can find their website online, um, and they do work with incarcerated people on multi-week accountability uh, stuff around particularly sexual violence and harm. Um, and so that exists and they have a, they've got a curriculum that they've just created that they are sharing in slow motion with folks in doing trainings with other people who want to do similar kinds of work. Um, there's a new group out of uh, Seattle um, and they are called uh, Collective Justice. And they are doing similar kinds of work on the inside, directly focusing on people who cause sexual harm and domestic violence. I'm putting them in there too. They're called Collective Justice and they do a lot of work on the inside with people. There's a great uh, CNN film that some of you may have seen called uh, The Feminist um, on Cell Block Y. Um, that's about Richie Rosetta. Uh, and uh, Richie was an uh, incarcerated person who was facilitating uh, gender-based violence uh, work, uh, kind of gender-based violence and accountability stuff on the inside for many years. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that um, it's really important to see that there's a lot of work uh, that has been happening uh, over many years uh, with people on the inside. It's, it's definitely not new. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Miriam. We've got another question. Um, this one's also pretty big. Um, I'm interested in seeing content that addresses how to keep people who continue to do harm in intimate partner violence situations out of jail and also preventing them from harming my client again. I don't want to send people to jail. How do I keep them away from my clients um, is basically the question. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, that's just not a, that's not a question I can answer because right. I don't have the answer for that question. Um, it's a question that's out there. Um, I also will say that for the most part, people who commit domestic violence don't end up incarcerated in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it, it behooves all of us to come up with some other ways to try to do that. There have been some, um, 
groups that have done community-based res restraining orders um, where they try to enforce restraining orders through community um, on people who are habitual um, harassers or habitual harmers. Um, and that though involves like people who, I always say like, one of the things that's really difficult about harm that occurs is that when somebody commits harm, sometimes our instinct is to wanna lean away from the person when in fact, what mo most of us, if we're in community with those people, we should be leaning in. Because what that means is like, we're the ones who are most likely to be able to intervene in a positive way than strangers. And so um, in some cases, you know, there've been stories, Creative Interventions has a story collection project. And one example of somebody who was a police officer who committed uh, perpetual uh, ongoing harm against his partner, uh, the story, the partner narrating a story about how her entire community came around her and some people stayed at her home for several weeks at a time, uh, helped watch her children. Um, the mother, um, her mother, who was uh, close to the abuser, uh, intervened in order to be able to get the abuser to basically uh, leave the home and stand and desist. Like they created a whole system amongst themselves to actually keep her safe. Um, so there's just a lot out there and there's a lot unknown. We have to try everything. Yeah, thank you. The bottom line is we have to try and really be creative. That's right. Um, and yeah. we have to get involved. We have to be non-bystanders. And mm -hmm. I know that's hard for people um, because people are worried about their safety and they're worried about all their kinds of things. But, you know, we got to be, we got to lean in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a question about um, someone who's interested in getting more involved in restorative practices when it comes to working with people who have harmed others and who have experienced harm. Um, they're asking how they can find opportunities to do this work. And I would say just keep looking. Um, there are folks who are doing the work. Um, Ahimsa well, there's, Collective. A, there's a specific training happening yeah. in New York that Ahimsa is doing in April. It's about restorative uh, approaches to sexual violence. Um, and I know that they also come out to people's uh, cities to do that mm -hmm. work. Um, and so that means, you know, you have to be proactive in this case. You're going to have to, you know, reach out to groups that are doing the work and pay them to come mm -hmm. and teach how to do it. And maybe that means getting a bunch of people in your state or in your city together so that you can, you know, pay for folks to come out and offer you the skill building that's needed in order to be doing that work. Um, so I really encourage people to think collectively about mm -hmm. how to, uh, you know, how to bring out the folks who know how to do this work to work with you on building up your skills or go to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And one of the things that we're hoping to do with this webinar series and the conference is, is to be able to connect people in a kind of more um, formal way as well. Um, there's another question that I can answer. Um, and then Miriam and Janelle, you could as well if you're interested. Um, knowing that rape crisis centers have become more professionalized and are largely state funded, how do you see rape crisis centers playing a role in facilitated restorative and transformative justice? Is it possible? It's not. Um, what, at least our position at Niscasa is, it is important for rape crisis centers to know who, who in their local area, who in their region can and do, will facilitate restorative and transformative processes. It's not really up to advocates to be able to facilitate these processes and it's not within their, it should not be within their um, roles, but we can connect people. And oh, thank you, Miriam. Miriam shared a link to an up, or sharing links to upcoming trainings. Awesome, we've got somebody in the chat saying that they do restorative practices trainings from Albany. That's fantastic. Um, we're coming up against the hour and there are some questions. What I'll do is I'll save them and see if we can answer them later um, so we can send out responses. Um, Miriam and Janelle, do you have anything you'd like to add in closing? Um, I will just answer one of the questions that I saw about somebody saying, how do you how do you facilitate RJ and TJ processes on college campuses? 
Right. I will say a couple, I just want to say a brief thing about that before ending. Um, I think that college campuses and college folks should be doing more work with outside folks in your communities. Um, and I think those may be places that actually offer like partnering with a community-based uh, organization that can facilitate RJ and TJ stuff is probably better than trying to deal with your Title IX office on your campus and the legal liability issues that your campuses are always trying to address um, or being afraid to address. I mean, I'm working with, I've been working with some students at Brown University for the last few years and they just hired a transformative justice coordinator for their campus. And there's, a, you know, and they have some supportive Title IX people, which is what's allowing them to try this. But I don't think it would work for most campuses, to be very honest with you. Um, there's a great person named Circus. I'm going to write Circus's name down. Uh, Mendez, who's a professor at a university in um, uh a university in California uh, and who has been doing work in Michigan for many years with their universities over there to try to figure out how to do RJTJ practices on campus. So people are trying. You should also come and listen to Stas and Lee um, mm -hmm. because they do a lot of campus work around TJRJ. So they'll have a lot of answers for you you can go to. I'm sorry, I know you have to end. So um, I just wanted no. to answer the question. This is great. Thank you so much. Um, we've also got recommendations of David Karp, formerly of Skidmore. He's now in San Diego doing a lot of um, campus RJ. Um, definitely somebody to also keep an eye on. Um, yeah, Janelle, anything to add in closing? Uh, yeah, there's 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 always like so much to add, and yeah. I, you know, I'm thinking like because you know. Like we, ha I'm sit on a restorative justice council here, um, but for the most part, it's it's they're more instant. There's, um, like, uh, like larceny or petty larceny or kind of like some of those smaller things. Usually, right, due to people not um, being in poverty, you know, mm -hmm. or trying to find a way or means to make an income off of uh, trafficking through the border. Um, certain instances like that and so trying to grab our people and put them back into the community instead of into the, the justice system on the Canadian uh, portion I'm able to exercise that uh, it's been much more difficult for us to do it on the U.S. side so believe it or not I'm in a community where one imaginary political line differentiates what part of the community gets certain types of services and doesn't um, but for me specifically, um, and trying to um, empower women and support women and trying to uh, specific provide service to them, I needed to build capacity with men. I had entered numerous rooms, hundreds of women in the room and very few men. And so it was really about trying to come home and where was I going to be able to start trying to build capacity around men and what was happening to our sons? At what point was the, the, the value of a woman diminished? At what point? Where did you learn? They learned it through sports. They learned it through their relationships. They watched their mother and father do it. So modeling behavior was extremely important, especially when it comes to families. So this is very much a family issue. It's not even, it's, you know, the, the effects that I've seen, right, happen to um, a whole little family is, is, is a lot that's when they're already struggling. And so for me, I, I, I worked really hard at trying to figure out where was I going to build capacity with men who could not only relate and making mistakes, but could also be these guideposts to help other men. So now, thankfully, today, due to some really strong prayers and some blood, sweat, and tears, you know, now we have men in the building helping us to show other men what accountability looks like, to show them what healing looks like, to venture into all those um, aspects. And, and I feel like personally for indigenous people, you know, our original origins are in this land. They're, all of our answers, all of our instructions, they're all rooted into this land. And so we do have the privilege, our beginning starts here. And so we always go back there to see what, what kind of um, resolution 
did they have originally before, right? They came with residential schools and prisons and institutions and took our language and they take everything else. And so, you know, I know that I have that to be able to rely on and I, and I can see where it's probably difficult, you know, um, you know, I try to understand what that's like for other people because I do have some history to go back into and say, how did my ancestors decide to keep a, a community healthy? You know, what was their what was their thought process? What was their decision making? Because everyone had everyone held statue, everyone held lib, everyone. You know, it's recorded uh, in in lots of different testaments about the the prosperity of indigenous communities and what they witnessed when they got here and it's just trying to help rem help us remember and help my community remember that we still have the capacity to um, generate that healing and that well-being and and a lot of that entails all of those things around um, you know emotions and uh, all those heavy subjects that we you know we, we go to therapy for right and so it's just us being able to utilize those medicines we have traditional songs traditional words protocols all of those things and when we follow them you know we see the results that you know we we really hope we pray you know for people to be able to leave here and uh, feel supported and not alone and and that's a big thing because if you don't ever see it if nobody shows you any different why how are we expecting anybody to do anything different you know our expectations have to be uh, you know i think somewhat realistic because if nothing changes nothing changes and if we don't start making an, a real investment into this younger generation we will always be on the receiving end of violence you know and it's really trying to help them navigate through all of that sooner than later and right now you know most of the effort is going into later and so it's always trying to keep that balance for me of you know uh, trying to get in there being a part of the prevention process and then also trying to give you know um really good quality support to people who are you know who are hurting you know and so for don't you know it's just you know it's 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 very much interesting and, and powerful and important you know, but I have a lot of faith and hope. I've seen some things that I could have only Im imagined, you know, and so I, I just, you know, super appreciative for everyone who joins in into these conversations willingly and, you know, put some effort into, you know, how are we going to start really helping people, um, you know, live good quality lives and giving them options and ultimately freedom. Thank you, Janelle. That's a really wonderful point to end on. Um, and I, I really just want to thank Janelle and Marianne for sharing your time, your expertise, your wisdom. Um, it's really greatly appreciated on, on our end. Um, and I just want to thank everybody who joined this afternoon too and who participated. Um, I'm saving all of your questions and the information that you, you, you want to learn more about um, so that we can provide more, more information in the future as well. Um, I entered, I put in a link in the chat box. Um, that is a link to the webinar evaluation. Please complete that if you're able to. I've got on the slideshow um, just a reminder about when our conference is and how to sign up to receive conference updates. Um, be sure to also register for the next couple of webinars with Sujatha Baliga and with Spring Up because they'll be able to go more in depth in some of these topics. And um, email me if you also, have any questions too. Chelsea, yes, can you also give people a heads up? Um, if people are already facilitating community accountability processes, um, Shira Hassan and I have a workbook out called Fumbling Towards Repair. Um, yeah. that's available through AK Press. If people want to pick that up, I'll put it in the links to the chat area. I'll put a link to it there. Um, it might be helpful if you're, as you're trying to think through processes. Yes, that will be really helpful. I'll, I'll post the link in there. Okay, thank you. But yeah, thank you everybody. Um, stay tuned and keep your questions coming, um, keep asking questions, and join us for the next few webinars.
Thank you, Janelle and Miriam. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Chelsea.